So we're not going to have heavy speeches. What we want, I mean, we are uh, running a little bit behind, but um, we'll catch up in this way. Um, in headline terms, okay, Savannah, what role would you say Africa's played in your journalistic career thus far? Thank you, Henry. The role Africa has played is huge, actually. I grew up in a sleepy village in Hampshire, but to a Ghanaian mother and an Italian father. And ever since the age of five, my mother had myself and my sister in the kitchen, carrying our younger brother on our back, peeling vegetables and onions to make stew. And then when we finished doing that, she had us carry a bucket of water on our head up and down the living room and dining room whilst polishing the floor with a cloth at the same time, just to make it entertaining for us, I guess, so that we were actually doing all the housework. It hasn't harmed you. It hasn't harmed me, and I'm still pouring water. Yes, okay. And I, and I grew up with a, with a massive love for Ghana and the desire to go to Ghana because I had a really enjoyable experience growing up having my, my relatives visit regularly to our family home. So when I moved to London and I started working in, in media, my first job was actually working for a black independent film production company, I started to develop my skills as a producer, as a journalist, as a columnist, uh, as a TV presenter. I, I moved on to work for a number of independent um, production companies, making programs for Channel 4, for Sky, for Sky One, um, for Channel 5. And it was around that point that I decided, you know what, I've got a calling to go back and give something back. I've learned all these skills in London, working for these great media houses, and I want to put something back. I want to enrich the African content that I'd seen on the various African platforms that I'd been watching whilst I was growing up. So at that point, I branched into working with a number of different independent uh, or, or private uh, African-owned or Africa-focused channels, both in the UK, but also in various uh, African countries, namely in Ghana, which was my very first experience for both public and private entities, also in Nigeria and in Zimbabwe as well. And I will never, ever forget my very first experience of going to interview, and it was actually in London working for one of the, one of the uh, channels that I was working for at the time, to go and interview the former Ghanaian president. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, this is it. This is what I've been waiting for. This is what I've spent all my years studying to get towards this point where I can meet these individuals, tell the story, and, and, and really, really start to have an impact in the way that, that news is being portrayed. After the interview, we returned back to um, the office, back to the studio uh, where we were going to now look at this footage, only to my horror to, dis to discover that I looked more like Violet from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory alongside the Oompa Loompas. I was completely purple. The screen was purple. The image was purple. I was purple. The president was, the former president was purple. This is J.J. Rollins. Uh, I'm not going to say. Oh. Possibly. <laughs> And so, and so I was mortified, but everybody thought it was quite comical and actually not that relevant that we were putting out something that um, hadn't completely crossed the T's and dotted the I's. So I can, I can talk countless, I can give you countless experiences, but what I can certainly say is that I went there with a real desire, a real drive to, to make a difference, but there's definitely uh, a need to pay attention to quality and to detail. I can see that you are being uh, sensitive and delicate about this, but let me push you a little further. Please do, Henry, please do. Okay, I um, it yeah, but indeed, indeed. Um, would you say you felt in your career more fulfilled working for these African-owned and managed outlets, whether in Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, or in the UK, more fulfilled working for those, with all the, some of the technical shortcomings that you've highlighted, or working for some of the behemoths, like the BBC, where you have all the resources that some man like Solomon can bring to bear, no, but at the Trump. same time, you may be a much smaller cog in a huge machine, a huge wheel, well-resourced, but with a particular agenda. 
I don't think you can really compare it. I've, I've had some very enlightening experiences working for the independents, and I wouldn't change it. I really, really wouldn't change it because I've learned so much more about our people. I've learned so much more about the way that we can achieve things and the desire and the passion to make a difference. And there are a number of reasons why things are the way that they are. And I'm not... I'm not going to condemn anybody or, or any organisation for what they've been able to do because I think everybody have started out with the mindset that they're going to make a difference yeah. and they're going to make a change. And we've seen a lot of channels come, we've seen a lot of channels go for a number of reasons. All right. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, Savannah. Solomon, what about you? Because you're yes. there as head of BBC Africa. Mm -hmm. I think the first African to hold this position, is that right? You're right. Come on, please. Thank you. Thank you. That kind of answers my question, what role has Africa played in your career and development? <laughs> but, 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 but we'll flesh it out a little bit. Yeah, on that one, I don't know how much time you want me to spend on down memory lane. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll do it in less than three minutes. Yeah. It goes back to Western Kenya where when I was in primary school, and thanks to road shows, we had the then broadcasters from Voice of Kenya touring my home district. And I saw this gentleman, he's still on, he's called Leonard Mambo Motella. He had headphones on him with a microphone. We couldn't make head or tail as young rural bred people, you know, young boys, what this was about. And it turned out that actually what he was doing was to record material for radio. I got fascinated by that picture. It got stuck in my mind that one day when I grow up, as we used to say those days, I want to be a policeman, I want to be a teacher. To me, I wanted to be that man. So everything that I did from that onwards was about learning how to talk, learning how to broadcast, imagining myself on radio. And I think that became even more articulated as I began to be aware about my own social, political life. When, as a youth, Kenya was undergoing tremendous political change, but you wondered how else can you listen to alternative voice? You couldn't hear it on the only state channel. To hear that, you had to tune to international broadcasters such as the BBC, Voice of America, and then later on Deutsche Welle. And that challenged me that how come for me to ever hear the voices of the likes of Jaramogi Ogingo Dinga the late, Martin Shikuku the late, and others that I had to tune to an international channel and of course via shortwave. And that fascinated me into wanting to go into journalism to bring about change. But as fate would have it, my first bite was at the state broadcaster. So what change was I going to bring, really? <laughs> um, but we kept working. We did what we could until I moved on to a private TV station uh, called KTN. And may uh, so he saw rest in eternal peace. There's a gentleman called Mohammed Amin who used to work for Reuters. When he died following that hijacking of his plane from uh, Ethiopia and plunged into the uh, Indian Ocean, Reuters decided to launch a fellowship award. And I became the first African to win that award, which then took me to the University of Wales, Cardiff, where I studied a postgraduate diploma in broadcasting. And I think that then put me in pole position to attract the likes of the BBC. And my journey into the BBC then began in 1998. Soon after graduating from Wales, I joined BBC Swahili Service as a producer. The BBC is an interesting organization. When you are in, it gives you opportunity to move around. It gives you opportunity to go to different programs and services. And I seized that opportunity. That exposure prepared me mentally and, of course, professionally to aspire to greater responsibility. I moved on to the African Productions and the African Dailies, where I worked on programs such as Focus on Africa briefly and Network Africa. And then I went to African Productions to work on 
talk about Africa. We used to invite some of you here to come into the studios where we then begin to harangue ourselves about issues uh, affecting Africa and we're gonna solve them in 30 minutes. Yes. That proved to be outdated. We wanted to be interactive, then we launched Africa Have Your Say, which then became Africa Live. From there on, I went back to Swahili Service as its editor. And it's from that that I became the editor for Africa. But just one thing which I hold dearly to my heart about being the editor of Swahili Service was to commission an investigation into the macabre world of trading in albino parts in Tanzania. And anybody who read or listened to news this week, to hear a one-year-old child being attacked, snatched from the mother, and the body mutilated for their parts to be turned into charms, to enrich certain people, or to help them win an election, guys, our job is not yet done. Thank you very much indeed for that, Sam. Thank you very much. <laughs> Barnaby, you've worked for a variety of organisations, BBC and now Al Jazeera as a roving correspondent. Tell us about the role Africa's played in all of that. Um, Africa has, has dominated my career. I joined the BBC World Service, Africa Service, uh, in 1991. I'd, I'd grown up in Kenya, so I had a, an interest and an empathy, I suppose, with Africa. Uh, and I stayed there 15 years um, at, the, at the BBC. It, it was a very exciting time to be in the African service, World Service Radio. We were extremely powerful and influential at that time on shortwave radio. It was, it was a different era. Uh, warlords from Liberia and Sierra Leone would ring up every day and ask to be put on air and say that they had taken Koidu or, or Tubmanberg had fallen and you had to try and make these very, very serious decisions on whether this was true or not. And the, you, in fact, your decision could turn something into a self-fulfilling prophecy. That, that was a humbling experience. After a couple of years, I got a little bit restless, and I thought I wanted to go and be a reporter in Africa myself. Uh, and so I went freelance, uh, and I, I spent several years in Mozambique and Angola at the end of the wars there. Um, and like everything in life, it, the more challenging something is, the more rewarding it is. Um, I had to learn Portuguese. Uh, let me tell you, surviving on a freelance salary in Luanda, Angola, for anyone who's been there, is <laughs> quite an experience. Uh, but after that, um, I got a, a, a proper reporter's job with the BBC in, in Nigeria for three years. Um, Nigeria has been an enormous part of my life ever since. That was 98 to 2001. I'm sure many of you will know it was a very dramatic period the end of military rule, the beginning of what I sometimes prefer to call civilian rule rather than democracy, but <laughs> uh, anyway, um, <laughs> and we can talk about that if you Distinction want. Distinction with a difference? Yes, <laughs> oh, well, an improvement of, of sorts, I suppose. Um, and then I was the BBC Southern Africa correspondent uh, for, for five years after that, uh, but I ended up being sent um, all over the continent as well. I left in 2006, mainly because the BBC wanted me to come back to London and do something not very interesting for a few years, which is one of the ways in which they, they work. Uh, and I joined this strange new outfit uh, called Al Jazeera English, um, really on a whim and on the basis that a lot of people, journalists who I knew and trusted, were joining it. Um, and they also kind of said that I could sort of go wherever I wanted to go in the world, which was, you know an amazing privilege. Uh, since when, I've mainly been in Europe, but uh, I put my hand up to go back to Africa whenever I can. So for Al Jazeera, I've been you know, back to South Africa and Mozambique and spent many weeks in the Central African Republic last year and back in Nigeria. Um, and also last year, I took six months off because Nigeria is, is such a, a, a big part of my life now. Uh, and I wrote a book about um, Am I allowed to plug my book briefly? Well, it's relevant. The book is called Burma Boy. <laughs> no. What is Burma Boy about, yeah, it's, briefly? Yeah, it's called Another Man's War. It, no, no. It, it, okay, it, it touches on many of the themes from this morning, actually. So I hope it's a fairer representation of, of Africa's contribution in the Second World War. Yes, yes, um, yes. But that rounds up me in Africa. <laughs> All right. Barnaby, thank you very much. And finally, uh, but not leastly, Omar. What would you like to know? Portrait of Omar as a young African man. <laughs> The role Africa has played in your gestation and development. 
Not just station, that's a bit kind of previous. <laughs> I'm not sure how to answer that question. You don't have to. No, no, I'm... <laughs> I'm a Tunisian who was born here and regularly visiting Tunisia. If you want my experience with uh, African media yeah. and the role that African media has played in, uh, in my life, well, my father is the founder of uh, a media, an African media group, so uh, I was born into African media, you can say. If you uh, d want to discuss Tunisian media, I can tell you that uh, prior, prior to the revolution four years ago, when I used to ask my uncle why is he reading the newspaper, he says, well, the only thing that I do read are the obituaries and the classifiers because that's the only thing you can trust. So uh, <laughs> uh, I remember as a uh, seven-year-old when I was watching TV, uh, the, the late uh, Habib Bourguiba, before the news, you could see him swimming in the Mediterranean in front of his palace. So, uh, so, yeah, but I've got lots of stories in terms of African media, which is, I think, what people are here to, uh, to hear and debate. No, no, indeed, indeed, the thing is, of course, I mean, you say you were born into it, but you didn't have to. I mean, I've met your father. He isn't that tyrannical. And if you, did, if you said, Dad, I don't want to, um, you know, work with you and one day inherit this um, eight-magazine um, publishing empire, uh, then he probably would have allowed you to go and chill in Tunis or something or do something differently. But uh, well, maybe not chill in Tunis, chill somewhere else, okay? But you decided clearly... I, I, was, not, I was not coerced to join the family business. No. Right, okay, but, but so uh, clearly... But, but, but I, I don't know if it's African tradition or not, but uh, I was brought up in an environment where people went and worked in the family business. Yeah. So it was always my intention, but my, my daughter, who's a lot more talented than I am, is not working for the family business, mm -hmm. so I was not coerced into it. But I think uh, I'm very happy that I joined the family business. I'm not a journalist uh, by training, like uh, my fellow colleagues here, but I think the industry is fascinating. And as an institution, I think we've got a very important role to play. And daily, the company values and the company culture, which I'm trying to pass on to uh, my colleagues who work for me, is that we've got a responsibility and duty to the African continent to raise the level of debate, to shape the African agenda, to make sure that we're asking the right questions and uh, search and. Uh, continuously cultivating a curious mind and asking the um, and mm -hmm. asking the right questions and I will make one plug actually because we are currently recruiting for a number of editorial positions mm. uh, so yeah. weren't expecting that were you he's got jobs <laughs> <laughs> so no no but I'm very serious actually and we want a young dynamic uh, people who are passionate about the continent I hate the word passionate because David Cameron uses it at every opportunity <laughs> when he's not at all passionate about everything no but people who actually care want to make a difference are very curious and uh, who, are, who love the humanity and uh, strong values that Africa has to give. So if you want, if you want to know what Africa has given me, it's human values and uh, the humanity of it all. Fantastic. <laughs> now, we've called this uh, section of the day, I know if it bleeds, it leads. We want to know if when Africans have a greater control of uh, their story, they do things, we do things differently, and what impact the arrival of some of the African-owned television stations is having on some of the bigger, more established operators. Uh, Omar, from your point of view, you're an African in charge of an African uh, publishing uh, organization. If it bleeds, does it lead at New African? No. <laughs> Explain. <laughs> What, what would the lead be? For example, what's on the lead at the front cover of uh, the, the current coming, edition? The, the, the current edition, which, oh, goes, out, which goes to print uh, this weekend, was uh, China, Africa. But really, in terms of our own magazine, we're having to change. The whole industry is changing, as, uh, as you all know, in terms of print media, which is where I derive 80% of my revenues, or where the group derives 80% of our revenues. So uh, that's changing. So in terms of our own publication, we want to have more investigative reports, more in-depth reports, uh, more variety, more um, some intellectual essays as well. So, uh, so that's what we're focusing on today is more in-depth investigative reports. So last month it was about Nigerian elections. So we, 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 what we, aspect of that did you focus on? Well, everything. So, so uh, I mean, there was one contributor who's a PhD student at SOAS who wrote about Boko Haram, who spent a long time in uh, northeastern Nigeria. Uh, the, the, the election, why these elections were different to, uh, to previous elections, mm -hmm. how things are changing, how things are evolving, uh, some uh, in-depth analysis on the various uh, candidates. So, uh, so yeah, this, year, I haven't right. actually, this month I haven't actually read the, uh, the cover story of New African, but New African businesses, there's a big cover story on, 
on the healthcare systems in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, so the business behind it, private, public, how does it work? Why has a country like Rwanda succeeded? What's now going to happen to, uh, to the healthcare industry following the, uh, the Ebola crisis? How the dynamics are going to change? How, uh, how, uh, how do African governments get their, uh, or spend money, uh, uh, devote their budgets to, uh, to healthcare systems. So at the moment, for example, a country like Rwanda mm -hmm. gets 50% of their budget through, uh, through, uh, through ODA, yeah. but they... Official development assistance. But they, yeah. dictate, uh, they dictate where, those, uh, where that money goes to. Uh, so yeah, so uh, in-depth reports really going into the, uh, the crux of the subject. Tremendous. And how excited are you by what's happening in the Af on the African television scene? at the moment with the new operators coming in, particularly in West Africa, more money, some of the people who previously wouldn't have been interested in investing their money, whether it's gained from oil and gas or whatever, into uh, media, into television. How excited are you about that, or do you view it as a um, magazine person, as more of a threat than an opportunity? How come you haven't teamed up with any of them, for example? Uh, okay. No, it's just interesting, it's interesting. Yeah. No, no, so why haven't we teamed up with... Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm or bought a channel. I'm always looking at new opportunities. At the moment, the way I look at it is uh, when you speak to African... I'm, I mean, we need to look at the business, ultimately. Yeah. Who's going to finance these things? So when you speak to people or African people who have ventured in TV, I mean, ultimately, what do they want? They want uh, numbers, because TV gives you numbers in terms of audience, and they want influence, ultimately. So, um, and they want to uh, affect the, uh, the, the, the narrative. So, uh, no, so, 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 so it's interesting. I don't think it's being done properly yet. Okay. Uh, I don't know why. Lucky for you, Solomon, eh? <laughs> I, don't, I, I, don't know, I, I don't know how much, uh, I don't know how much it would cost uh, to, to, to do this properly, but we're, we've got new entrants in, uh, in, the, in, in the market, and uh, the, quality of, the quality of reporting, the quality of the, uh, the programs is, uh, is improving. Yeah. And, uh, and I think the business case is becoming uh, stronger and stronger. Okay. Whether, whether, whether TV in 10 years' time will equal numbers and influence, we'll, uh, we'll see. I think, it, uh, I think it will still be very extremely influential. Yes. But, uh, but there will be other, uh, other ways of reaching and influencing a, a large audience. Okay. So, uh, but do, do we want to get into uh, TV? Not necessarily TV, but video content for sure. Yeah. Tremendous. Uh, Omar, thank you. And the reason why I tapped uh, Solomon on the back in that way uh, is because you said it hasn't been done properly yet. And I say lucky for you, uh, Solomon, of course, uh, because the BBC surely would view the arrival of uh, new entrants into the market, some have come, more will come, uh, as a threat, surely, to your dominance, certainly, of um, the eyeballs watching from the African continent. Mm -hmm. the continent sorry. I think... Um First of all, in terms of our presence in Africa, BBC World Service is big on radio, and that is, um, it goes back many, many years, pre-independence, in fact. And that is why, to date, we can talk about the BBC being the leading international broadcaster on radio in Africa, with nearly 88 or 90 million listeners every week. And some of you visited countries like Liberia or Sierra Leone or Tanzania in East Africa or even Nigeria itself, uh, you've got to simply listen to people and they'll tell you stories about how um, they, they interact with the BBC via uh, language services such as BBC Hausa service in West Africa, mm -hmm. BBC French, Somali service, Swahili service, and of course in the Great Lakes region, Kenya, Rwanda, or Kirundi. In terms of television, it's only two years ago in 2012 that we felt that we needed, as BBC, to also venture into television. Why? The images that people in places such as China see, the perceptions they have of Africa, whether it's in China, India, or Japan, those perceptions, those attitudes, those images is what they get from television. Because BBC World Service or the African service does not broadcast to China or wherever it is, unless if they're tuning in via internet nowadays. But before that, they had to see it on television. Now, as Barnaby will tell you, who was then reporting the Af or telling the African story that will then be beamed into the living rooms in China, Japan, and Asia, and other Asian countries, or in Europe? Who was telling that story, and what kind of story was it and that is why we keep hearing the four Ds being mentioned every time Africa is covered. There must be death, there must be destruction, there must be disease and disaster. 
Where are stories about entrepreneurial Africans? Where are stories about what the mantra we hear about Africa rising, which of course we shouldn't swallow bait hook and sinker because we need to interrogate those stories as well. But at least the world needs to see a different side of Africa. There's a lot that's happening in Nigeria, beyond, of course, Boko Haram, beyond the elections. There's a lot happening in Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea, despite the current Ebola outbreak, which we cannot underestimate. There's a lot also happening even in Somalia. Some of you who visited Somalia, or if there are any colleagues here from Somalia, they will tell you it's a country that has proved the world wrong in many aspects. They've been able to run an economy without the kind of infrastructure you'd find in a stable country. That story needs to be told. When you see telecommunications thriving in a country like Somalia, to an extent that if you call Somalia, the line is even clearer than if you called a country that has been peaceful for more than 40 years, it tells you something about Somalia. That story has got to be told. So for us going into television, we had that responsibility that the world needs to not just see the Africa they're used to seeing, but also to see the other Africa. And we went a step further. That story has got to be told by African talent. Because we've got journalists who were born, they're bred, and they live the African story. That the guys who know how to move from one village to another, they know the nuances, the cultural practices of people, they will tell you, when you go into an African village and you speak to the elders, if you want to know they've agreed with you, how will you know? It's easy for them to nod their heads and to say, yes, yes, thank you very much. But it may take an African elder to simply pinch my skin to tell me, son, you guys don't know what you're doing. So it's very important when you tell a story to appreciate the local talent of that area for they know the story, the people, the environment better than you do. This is not to underestimate the expertise we get when people travel around and they also want to see the world from a different point of view. If I was to go to Japan to report anything from Japan, it is not that I'm going to teach the Japanese how to tell their own story, no. But there may be experiences I'm going to exchange with them and to borrow from them to enrich what we're telling the world. So don't mistake me when I say the African story has got to be told by the African talent to mean that it's got to be exclusively African talent. It's important for us to mix with the expertise from elsewhere. Mm -hmm. How much impact has the increased attention that Africa is getting from the likes of CCTV, from the increased airtime that we're seeing, even on the likes of CNN, I think we've got three African strands now. Uh, Bloomberg has an African outlet. What impact has that had on you and how you see the BBC African uh, content going forward? When a continent gives you 80 million listeners every week or 90, it tells you something. Respect them, listen to them, walk with them, laugh with them, cry with them. That's the message Africa is telling BBC. And Africa is also demonstrating that we are not just a continent that is a source of resources where you come, get what you want to get, get off and go away, and you leave the continent to its own fates and devices. No, we are saying that Africa deserves respect, Africa deserves a voice, and must be done in a manner that is not patronizing. Mm -hmm. So for the likes of CCTV or CNN or BBC and, and the ilk, they've discovered there's much more to Africa than just going to cover a story about war, disease, and death. There's also business in Africa. For example, at the moment, when you look at one of the places where advertisement revenue has been rising year on year, you find it in Africa. Mm -hmm. When economies in the West and other parts of the world were on a downward trend, when they had stagnated, economies in Africa were thriving. And that was reflected through the advertisement and media industry. The only snag at the moment for African media market or African economies is when you look at what's happening now in the television industry with the migration from analog to digital. Mm -hmm. I think that's where Africa is massively challenged. To date, only three African countries have been able to move from analog 
to digital. And one of them did it painlessly, uh, that is uh, Mauritius. Tanzania tried, uh, Rwanda, Rwanda is trying as well, but the rest of the countries, they either have not started, or if they have started, that journey has ended up in court or in some kind of muddy water somewhere. Mm -hmm. But the opportunities for the likes of the BBC, NCC TV, Al Jazeera, and CNN in Africa, the future, the present is bright, the future is even brighter. The challenge now is for African investors. Who in Africa can actually now come up with an instrument that would, or with a, with a kind of organizational company that can rise to a level where mm -hmm. Al Jazeera or CNN or BBC are? Yeah, because we haven't yet got that. Uh, Savannah and Barnaby, uh, I'm not suggesting you should launch it. I'll come to you in just a moment. Uh, Omar, you wanted to come in quickly. And I just wanted to add to what Solomon uh, has just said. There was in December a, uh, a meeting in Dakar, which is La Francophonie, which is the equivalent of, let's say, the Commonwealth. And uh, really, in terms of future audience and uh, the future market, the future French market, so to speak, it's, uh, it's Africa. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's nowhere else. And now... You were asking about uh, French media groups. I know that French media groups are increasingly looking at Africa in terms of, uh, in terms of the future market because they know that their market is shrinking, if anything, and, uh, and they're investing in, uh, in the future of the continent. We can talk business models later, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'll mention a few. But uh, anyway, so I just I wanted to mention that. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Savannah, you're one of the uh, people that I know who has gone to an African country and tried to work as, uh, alongside... Uh, local talent. Tell us more about uh, the experience and whether or not there are opportunities for people uh, here. I mean, apart from working for Omar, uh, <clears throat> there are lots of people who say to me all the time, I've been trying to get into the BBC, I'm trying to get into CNN, I'm trying to get into Sky, uh, da, da, da. it's so difficult, they don't want my talent, maybe I should go to Africa, but how do I start? You know, is, I mean, will the local people resent me? Um, are they going to pay me properly? Are they going to pay me BBC wages? That kind of thing. What, 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 what did you find? <laughs> I found a lot of things yes. when I got there. Um, and just, just to, to support what Solomon said before, actually, because he's absolutely right. There is a massive opportunity in Africa for us to improve and to build on what we're already doing. I had the privilege of working alongside Solomon, actually, for about a year or so. I was presenting for um, World Have Your Say on World Service Radio before moving on to TV for World News to produce Focus on Africa. Yeah. And there are a number of people, there is a, a big team of talented individuals who are doing their very best to portray the news in the best way that they can, and also on the ground, so the locals who can actually get in, in, in between the cracks and speak to the people that matter, who can help to deliver those real stories. And so for us to take that to another level with the other channels or whether as an individual wanting to relocate back, it is very much about being prepared to be on the ground, to get into the mix, to speak to the locals, but also to be able to accept that the standards of production are developing. They are still working towards becoming the very best that they can be. And so working within that arena and understanding it's not always going to be perfect. Yeah. And what about, um, I mean, we talk about models. You mentioned models uh, earlier, uh, Omar and, and Solomon, in fact. Bloomberg, everyone's now talking about Bloomberg and then this oh. thing called Bloomberg Africa, which I think you were a presenter on um, last year. And the model was one where they borrowed the name. Is that right? Um, is that how it worked? The franchise, yeah. yeah. Mm. I'm a businessman, you see. For, they took the franchise. How, how, do, how does that work and, and how's that going? Absolutely. So essentially after leaving... Um, BBC World News at the beginning of last year, I then joined Bloomberg to be a presenter on a show for um, their show, uh, for, for, sorry, for Bloomberg Africa. So the way it works is that you've got Bloomberg and then, as you quite rightly heard just now, a franchise, which is the Africa franchise, which was bought by uh, a Nigerian individual. Who, is, this, is this Rotimi? Uh, quite possibly. R R yeah, R Rotimi Pedro. It's fine, it's out there online, so I'm not breaking any secrets. Yeah. Rotimi Pedro. Well there done. you go. Well done, Henry. Well, uh -huh. done. well done. I'm a Yoruba. Go He's on. A, <laughs> secretly a Nigerian. So, uh, so the franchise was bought, and then the idea is that they produce content from the African continent, but also remotely, so from London, uh, to populate that bandwidth that they have within, within, within the Bloomberg uh, network for EMEA. 
So they, they were doing that, and they have been doing that for the last year or so, and they have got talent in South Africa as well as Lagos, and they're tra planning on expanding it in Kenya, uh, Nairobi, as well as in London. Mm -hmm. So that's how the franchise works. And what do you want to ask me? Um, what was it like working there? What was it like working there? Uh, we, we were quite fortunate in that we were working from the actual uh, Europe headquarters, which is in Finsbury Square. So we had access to all of the facilities that Bloomberg itself has. Mm -hmm. Quite often with a lot of the other franchises is that they have to set up as a complete entity. They've then bought the name for a period which they have to pay for year on, year out. But then everything that they do, they will do it remotely from their location. So they have to equally, in the same way, invest in all the infrastructure, the talent, et cetera, et cetera. So we were slightly fortunate in that we had access to all of um, the equipment and the facilities. And, and the quality of content certainly has improved. So we've seen it move from the kind of quality that I mentioned in the earlier days, going back a long time ago, yeah. uh, to actually trying to develop the programming and having a greater focus on what is relevant to the African audience. Mm -hmm. And um, when it comes, we talked about, about if it bleeds, it leads. Big question is, it, you've got a bomb somewhere in most news outlets, whether <coughs> African or non-African, people are going to go with the bomb. You know, it's the kind of most shocking thing. Mm -hmm. But in ordinary time, peacetime, what's the agenda? What's the narrative? What are you trying to tell people? Because in some um, programs, even if there's no bomb, they still want blood. They still want something that's going to really disturb people, mm. as opposed to saying, as opposed to leading with something that's going to make them think, wow, I didn't know that. Mm. What, 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 what was the agenda there? I believe the agenda was to give a very balanced approach, so still show what's, what's happening, because you can't run away from the fact and pretend that all these things are not happening. Yeah. So still portraying that, but also trying very much to show the other side of Africa, show the lighter side. I know even when we were producing Folks in Africa for the BBC, out of a 30-minute daily programme, we still tried to make sure that one package within that in the second half of every programme was focused on something that was positive, mm -hmm. entertaining and light, even though there's a lot of other things going on as well. And I do believe that's what Bloomberg Africa have done their very best to try to do. But as you heard in the very first session this to, morning... To still focus on Africa's idea... See this is what I wanted. <laughs> Did I hear that? Yeah, let's talk attention. about this after. <laughs> no, 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 go for it now. Go for it now. <laughs> No, 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 it's all right. No, no I think, I, I don't think it's just Bloomberg Africa. I think, any, I think any private entity that has tried to establish themselves as the voice for Africa, yeah. they've tried to deliver that African story. They've tried to go out there and tell the African story by Africans, whether it is Africans or whether informed individuals who can equally tell the story. As Solomon said, it's, it's not about cutting anybody out, but it's about telling the, um, as, as best as possible, the honest truth balanced uh, story. And my point, I've forgotten now. What was, what was You've the, made lots of points. I've made, I've, made, I've, no, made, no, no. I've made lots of points. But um, I think, as somebody said in the very first session, this is what I was going okay. to say, is that access to archive information is, mm. is a nightmare. And if it's not archive information it's, or, or footage, it's actually having somebody on the ground who can get that information for you in a timely fashion. Mm. And it's the competition that you're up against, trying to deliver daily news or weekly news and getting a cameraman to the source who's going to deliver that footage back to you in London or wherever so that you can package that and putting it out at the right time. That's one of the biggest challenges. Mm -hmm. And that challenge is even exacerbated by social media because as you're battling to you. do that, guys are already I, around I, with exactly. Twitter and Facebook. I was going to say, and uh -huh. I, didn't, I didn't want to talk too long, but precisely, the way that m news is going now, social media, Twitter, Facebook, that's where people are getting their stories. And so there's that much extra competition that they have to come up against to try to get their news out as quickly as possible. Can I just, I'll just um, yeah, put in, Henry, go, yeah. I've been talking about these, these new African channels which are coming up, like Arise... Yeah. TVC, TVC the other yeah, Nigerian yeah. one owned by Bola Tinubu, I think. Yeah, that's right, Tinubu. Uh, We've got this, a this Afrique 24 in Paris. In Paris, yeah. But yeah as well, you've got... I mean, I think there's... I'm not a businessman, but what I can see from Al Jazeera and what I've seen from the BBC is that a 24-hour news channel is, is a sink. It, you will it's never a beast, make, isn't it? it? You will money. never make money on it. And that's not... That, that, let me let you into a secret. That's not why the British government funds BBC World. It's not to make money. That's not why the Qatari government funds Al Jazeera. That's not to make money. These are, if you like, tools of soft diplomacy. Yeah. I would argue constructive ones. But they are ultimately... <clears throat> 
state-funded, uh, and anyone who's had to sit in a hotel room and watch on a loop CNN or BBC World or Al Jazeera English, I apologize, because that's tedious as hell. I mean, <laughs> you can watch one of these you know, for an hour, but if you're stuck for the second hour, it's, it's, a, it's a dreadful <laughs> experience. And just to, 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 <laughs> to feed that beast for 24 hours with quality, innovative packaging and, and links from all over the world, and, and perhaps especially Africa with the logistical difficulties yeah. in, in the more remote parts of Africa, it, there's no way you, you, that we're not even close to achieving a money-making model there. Mm -hmm. And as we've probably alluded, TV is a gradually dying medium anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How high up the um, Al Jazeera agenda would you say this emergent African story is? Because uh, obviously you go as and when you can, but I'm just wondering how hard you have to argue for an African story that isn't bleeding, but that may be to do with... Um, I don't know, renewable energy from the Sahara powering other parts of Africa? Sure. You know? Well, if it, I mean, if it bleeds, it leads was not invented in, re in relation to, to Africa. Yeah. It, it, it's, it, that, that's news. There are two countries in Europe that I've been to again and again in the last, last year. Ukraine, I'd never been there before. I've been there six times in the last 12 months. It's bleeding. And Greece is bleeding money, and that's the other place I go to. Yeah. And I'm sorry, that, that is how news works, and there's nothing Africa-specific in that regard. Mm -hmm. But I suppose you could say that Al Jazeera, with its deep pockets, saw an opportunity when it launched in 2006 mm -hmm. uh, to tell a more complete African story. Uh, and one of the reasons why I don't go to Africa as much as I, as I used to, and it, it's a, uh, an entirely appropriate and good reason, is that there's a distinct preference uh, for African talent to be on screen and, and telling that story. So, for example, the Nigerian elections, which should have happened two weeks ago and might happen in four weeks' time, you know, we, we had four reporters there. Every, every single one is an African. And, yes. and uh, you, you know, th that's the way in which things are going, and that, that, that's a good thing. Tremendous. Uh, can, I just, yeah. can I just add to that? Because, um, and this is again in the defense of a lot of these private uh, companies and channels, entities, is that where you cannot get a reporter somewhere to, to deliver news, you are reliant on what's available. It's completely different to radio, obviously, where you have the luxury of being able to talk endlessly about whatever it is without having to show any pictures mm -hmm. apart from with your imagination. Um, you have to be able to fill... 24 hours with pictures and so quite often a lot of these uh, channels are reliant on packages from the likes of AFP who are sending reporters or they have reporters all over the world who can film what is relevant to them and you have access to those packages which you could then use to populate your channel but then well, somebody you else, are limited, everybody else does, they? <laughs> well, they're limited to what's available. Mm -hmm. Which is one of the reasons that some channels like Arise have struggled uh, with. You know, they, 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 they struggle to lead with an African story because they feel it's the only good footage, the recent yeah. footage coming in is Ukraine. They'll lead with Ukraine. Mm -hmm. This is part of the problem. Yeah. I think we've talked enough for now. I think we need to kind of spread things out and get some interaction. I'm going to take questions in batches of three, and because I want as many questions as possible, I'm going to be a benevolent dictator, <laughs> but with some steel in my glove if you go on for too long. So make it count. Don't repeat anything that's already been said, please. I say that as a brother to you all. Okay, so let's have a look. Clutches of three. I'm going to ban the front area initially because you already have privileges. Okay, people who've already spoken, you are going to be last. Let the last be first and first be last. Um, okay, no, no, I can tell you've already spoken. Gentlemen there, yes. That's in batches of three, yes? Make it count, please. Okay, please tell us who you are and what your question is. Hi, my name's Ted Ross. I'm an MA student here in the Centre for International Studies and Diplomacy. Speak um, up. My question is around um, a lot of what we've talked about has been external media houses, representation of Africa. So we've got panelists from the BBC, Al Jazeera. Um, what do the panel think about how um, African countries, other African countries are covered by other African media? Often people in different countries look to the Al Jazeera's or the CNN if you're in East Africa to tell you what's going on in Nigeria and vice versa. How much is African media doing about covering other African stories in an accurate way? Excellent question, Tedros. Well used. Okay, next. Raise your hand properly so I can see it. No, no, okay. Uh, where, where? Is that gentleman there? Yeah, okay. No, hang on. Have you already spoken? 
You spoke already. No, you can't speak again. Okay, uh, who else? Yeah, yes, okay, up there, yes. Woman who hasn't spoken over there, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, my name is Maureen. And actually, when I first heard about this um, talk and seminar in itself, the first thing that came to mind is about representation of, like, just generally the new generation, African generation in in the UK. Yes. Um, I think one particular person who comes to mind who's really championed for the black and ethnic minority um, in representation is someone like Lenny Henry. He speaks a lot about the fact that we are not on on television. And to me, that's more striking. It's, e it, it's, it's, it's an option for me to go back to Kenya, yes, but what is it, can, what is it that I can do to actually be... Um, you know, an active, like, creative within the industry here and make an make a impact. What can you do? OK, so you're, asking, you're looking for a, an answer to that question. OK. And let's have a third, somebody from somewhere else. Raise your hand. OK, yeah. No, 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 not you. If you've spoken already, keep your hand down. <laughs> no, seriously, because we've got 300 people here. Lady there, lady there. It doesn't matter. Go there. Yes. Hi there, Rachel Hamada. I'm a freelance journalist. Uh, we've alluded a bit to the issues of state ownership of television. What about private ownership, for example, of individuals who are involved in oil and gas? What are the implications in reporting on things like resource issues within Africa? Tremendous. Okay. Uh, external media, African media on Africa. Hmm. Let's think. Solomon. Um, African media. Do they do a better job? Are they as interested? Um, Okay, I think um, it depends on the story, and it depends on the various media companies. Um, in terms of, let me speak first of all in terms of newspapers, because I think newspapers do a better job, maybe it's because of space, uh, but I think newspapers do a better job of reflecting stories from elsewhere. <coughs> Those stories are normally available through uh, wire agencies such as Reuters, AFP. And you find a story about, uh, say, Zanzibar. I read a story about Zanzibar dolls, the history, the style, the culture of the Zanzibar people, and the, the, the kind of dolls into their houses, those uh, vintage mm -hmm. houses in Zanzibar. I saw that story covered um, you know, extensively by a Nigerian newspaper, and that afforded people in Nigeria an opportunity to learn something different from another part of the continent. But in terms of television, in terms of radio, that's where there's a big challenge. Television because of, number one, how easy or difficult it is to get footage about events happening beyond your own boundaries. I don't see how a Tanzanian TV station would be able to cover something happening in Botswana if it does not have access to footage from that particular country. The issue of cost comes in. Is it affordable to purchase that kind of footage from any of these agencies? And majority of those agencies, by the way, they are all international, the AFPs of this world, APs and Reuters. The only thing that maybe helps some of these broadcasters in Africa is when they form their own regional groupings through which they can exchange content. But there are certain type or bespoke content you want, which is not covered by these stations. And therefore, it's so difficult for an African TV station to cover events beyond their own boundaries. Is the there enough people, interest? Is there enough interest? Now, we're just coming to that. Now, if you want to see, if you want to now test whether there is interest in a country about what's happening beyond somebody's own environment, look at or listen to radio. And radio increasingly is going local, if anything, vernacular. So people are withdrawing into their own little environments. Let me know, first of all, what's happening here before I care about what's happening to people in Uganda or in Zimbabwe or in Lesotho. But that's the notion I'm challenging. That's the notion the likes of BBC Focus on Africa are challenging this pan-African um, uh, offers we are, we are making. Why? We are saying the world is a globalized village whether we like it or not. Each one of us here comes from maybe an African country. Your, your, your parents, your siblings, your friends want to know how you're faring on in the UK. If something happened here, who is going to tell them? If your local radio station, if your local newspaper, if your local TV station does not want to cover anything international. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm saying that before African broadcasters recline into their own small little um, uh, cocoons and say we're only going to cover things that are of relevance to our people, they've got to imagine just how globalized the world has become. 
when events happened in America, whether it was the September 11th attacks, when things happened in Japan, this, the tsunami uh, in Japan, and other big global events that have happened, you will find there were Africans there. Yeah. Take, for example, the, 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 the recent events in Paris, Charlie Hebdo riots. It is a very interesting story. One of the suspects in that attack is a Malian young man. From the same country, you have a Malian who then rescued people in France. Yes, yes. And so you can begin to imagine this is enough, this is an, these are two African families in France. How do you then not tell that story? to an audience, not just in Mali, but across Africa. All right. um, Omar, you wanted to make a brief intervention on that as well, African media on African countries. I, th I think Solomon's raised all the points, okay. but, but I wanted to say that uh, I wasn't here this morning, but I hear that people were worried about the uh, African portrayal in, uh, in international media, mm -hmm. but I'm worried actually with the way African portray their news in their own media. Uh -huh. what's, uh, what's the concern? So, well, I find it very divisive. I find it... Uh, uh, where it pays its ways, shall we say. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so yes, I'm very worried. And I, and, I, and I think that what we're trying to do occasionally, we're not thinking for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to replicate what's happening in other media. So we use the BBC or Al Jazeera or whatever as a benchmark. And we say, oh, we need to, do, we need to question things that, that... We need to question things the same way as they do on hard talk. Whilst really what we want to do is we don't want necessarily want to try um, find a, po uh, a politician out. What we want to do is we want to raise issues with him. We want to see what's behind his thinking. What's, what is his agenda? But what we're trying to do is we're trying to find him out. So we're trying to ask, yeah. pretend to ask him tough questions without having thought about it. So more of the David Frost instead of the Jeremy Paxman. Well, not you, necessarily. A British I, kind I, of example. I just, I just think that we need to think what it is that we want to get out of something okay. or someone or a story and then approach it in that particular, uh, that, that particular way. We don't Fantastic. need to copy others. We need to set our own agenda. Okay. Before we get to that middle question, I'm going to go to the third one. Is, Rachel's talked about state ownership and private ownership. You were concerned uh, about... Private interest, a bit like HSBC, you might say, the whole story. So you've got a private interest, well, you know, <laughs> and the Daily Telegraph, you know what I mean? Exactly. Um, uh, how concerned should people be about that? Um, either of you, I, I, Absolutely, the, the potential is there. And, and I think Nigeria will be a good case because there are some very powerful people who own the new upcoming channels in Nigeria. Uh, they have political interests in the elections that are coming up. And so when I was in Lagos last month, people were looking at these new channels very carefully and seeing on which side of the divide they fall. And there's mm. absolutely uh, every reason to, to be sceptical and to assume that they will come under the same interest that a state-funded broadcaster will uh, come under the same sort of pressure that a state-funded broadcaster will come under when its direct interests are, are at stake. So we should be very, very sceptical of these, of these private businessmen. Welcome their money, but if they... If they respect the media and if they, they allow the editorial staff to get on with it, wonderful. If not, call them out on it. All right. Uh, Savannah, I wonder if you might also handle this question, given that you have worked for a number of African-owned uh, operators in Africa. And our friend over there said, well, yeah, that's fine. I could go to Kenya or whatever. But, you know, she wants to make a difference here. She wants to uh, maybe ply her trade here. And Lenny Henry has been talking about diversity here in the UK. I mean, that's for another conference, I think, because, of course, um, that's a very, very big subject that people have been trying to tackle in this country for, what, 35 years or so? And Marie, and Rui, you know, what do you think? What, so what specifically do you, are you asking as well. Yeah. Mm. Well, is our question still there? Raise your hand because I didn't fully get your question either. I, yeah. I, I, I didn't get your question. It. I didn't get your question, but uh, I work with uh, with a Kenyan business partner, and um, I mean he's full on. I don't I hate using this word, but full on Africa. But basically, he says that Africa is a state of mind. It's not a geographic location. So you can uh, you can contribute in many ways without having to be based there. So the, the way you are dressed, you see, with your head wrapper, me, a state of mind, we are global Africans. Anyway, no, in fact, to, 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 to our lady there, my, yes. my sister there, I would say, for example, in BBC Africa, what you're trying to do as well is to attract African talent in this country. Uh, people like you. Really? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> pe 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 people like you, uh, of course, going through a competitive process, if I've got to sound now properly. Um, the thing is, uh, and not just to broadcast in English, but also in the other African languages we broadcast in. But sometimes 
it puzzles me to meet somebody from Somalia who cannot speak Somali language mm. or you, you you meet somebody from East Africa Kenya Uganda Tanzania and they can't speak a word in Kiswahili and you wonder how, how could how could this be yet you've got people in this country white people in this country or Chinese even they speak perfect Kiswahili so what happens to you an East African you come here and you've forgotten your Kiswahili maybe they never knew it um, <laughs> thank you yeah yeah do, do, can you is that lady, just raise your hand again, because uh, we just want to refine your question. Okay, I think my question, as you mentioned, like maybe it is for a different seminar, but you have touched on some of the points. Like, um, basically, my main point was how do I make an, a difference? Not necessarily a difference, but make an impact. I want to use my education for something. I got into debt to actually make... <laughs> to be able to we can't help job. with that, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be able to get a job out here, I don't necessarily want to be, able, you know, to have to go somewhere else. And okay. at times I feel that that's the route that people are giving me. And you want to, as a young African woman, you want to work in the media here in this country? Yes. Okay. Can I, so can I, I yeah, definitely. Um, 100% focus on your craft and doing the very, very best you can with that, making sure that whatever you put out is of the highest quality, regardless of the funding issue, regardless of um, access to resources. Make sure that if you are putting out content and you're putting yourself and you want to put your skills into best practice, do it in the highest possible quality. Because it's the only way that we will start to be able to represent ourselves in the full context and be respected by every other network. And do you speak any African languages? This is a man for you, okay? Excellent. Well done. <laughs> well done. We, 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 oh, and Henry, Henry yeah. should have actually answered even that question because when, when you look at the press review on BBC at night, it's one of the regulars on that program. How have you managed to convince the BBC that you're the kind of person, the quality they're looking for? for by speaking review? truth to power. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, by being myself. Uh -huh. So I'm, I'm not being cowed. Yeah. I'm not being crushed by the weight of default man. No way. This is who I am. And I can go there and challenge whoever I'm on the panel with and yes. speak mm. truth. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, we want three more questions. People who haven't spoken before, and then I'll get to those who have already. Okay, lady there. Lady there, no, no, right behind the barrier. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Roshan Reid. I'm a researcher at the University of Manchester. And I just wondered about this um, issue of there being a lack of people on the ground, certainly with Western media, to report on African issues. And it seems to me that in this country, certainly, they've turned to aid workers to report on the wow. issues, which perpetuates this particular yeah. kind of narrative. And I wondered if the panel had any comments on that. Great. OK, next again. Hi. Well, who, who's speaking? Me. Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name's Senna. Um, I noticed that we covered print media, TV and radio, but I wanted to get your opinions on online, new media and bloggers and yeah. um, their ability to shift the narrative and develop credible content. Do you see them becoming the next news agencies online? Good question. Thank you. And let's have another one. Ready around a bit. All right, then you've got your hand up. Hi, my name is Sammy. I'm from National Prison Radio. Um, but I'm also half Turkish, and in the last uh, 10 or so years, Turkey has been quite involved in East Africa and Somalia and Kenya other places. And I was wondering, um, in the organizations that you work for, whether you've seen there's a kind of increased interest in African stories, say in the Middle East, in, in China, it's obviously a big issue, and whether that changes the kind of stuff that, that you produce and what kind of implications that might have. All right, thank you very much. We'll start off on that one, question number six, with, with uh, you, Barnaby. So, uh, increased interest in, in the Middle East. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, I, you know, I'm, I'm a product of that. Al, Al Jazeera English set up in 2006 and, and hired hundreds of journalists from, from venerable organizations. Um, Turkish state TV, TRT, I think, is setting up an English language service. I hope I'm not breaking that news too very soon. Um, I, I know some people who've... <coughs> Who have joined it um, and I think the BBC and the CNN and the positive changes we've referred to are a reflection of that as mm -hmm, well. Mm -hmm. Could I just say something yeah, about the yeah. aid, ag aid yeah. agency yeah. very yeah. quickly? Um, I mean I, I, I absolutely agree about you know we, we, we talk about the domination of, of Western media but 
of the African continent, and, and clearly that is very much there. But throughout my career, I've also seen a gradual withdrawal of, of the Western media. D does anyone know the last time that the main American networks, by which I mean the domestic networks, the CBC, NBC, NBC yeah. um, ABC, ABC. Mm. do you know when they last had a resident correspondent on the African continent, and by a correspondent with a full bureau and all the rest of it? It was 1994. Wow. When Mandela was released and walked free, they felt that was the end of African the African story. African story done. <laughs> So, and you can, and the result is a dreadful paucity in coverage, a, 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 a dreadful lack of understanding of, of Africa in the United States that has affected all of us and parachute correspondents. And yes, aid agencies, you're absolutely right. I have a confession to make, and it feels like a confession, given the tenure of, of the conversation this morning. My wife works for Save the Children. Uh, she, she works in the film and photography department, and she is very, very busy supplying media outlets with pictures with content from troubled parts of Africa yeah. because media organizations can't afford or can't be bothered to go there yeah. themselves. And whilst broadly speaking, I would say Save the Children is a good thing and I uh, applaud its desire to save children, I don't think it should be setting our news agenda yeah. and I think it should be treated with just the same skepticism mm -hmm. that I would treat the British government or the Nigerian government or the South African government. Thank yeah. you very much for that, Barnaby. It's, it's, not, a, it, it, it's not a confession. <laughs> it's, it's called uh, declaring interest. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Are you going to declare an interest too, Solomon? <laughs> no, but I, I think uh, the question about aid agencies is a critical question. Guys, this is it. Because when you look at it, whenever a disaster occurs, or whenever there's a conflict, by the very nature of their service, they gain access to areas the media cannot. And also because of the, um, the, the way they are primed to respond in, a, in an event, in an, in, a, in an emergency, they've got everything in place. They've got the template on which to simply swing into action. And these guys are in Borno State, Northeastern Nigeria. In the newsrooms, there'll be a question about, oh, who we do we need to deploy? Which reporter is ready? Which cameraman is willing to go? Have they done There's something we call hostile environment training, where you cannot be deployed unless you've done that training to equip you with the skills on how to survive when you are in that kind of area. So while those conversations are still going on and budgets still being done, the aid agencies, they are already there. They have captured the story as it, it happens. The dilemma for us even further is to reach those places, you sometimes can only access those places using vehicles or means by aid agencies. Accommodation, where are you gonna stay? Where will your crew stay? Again, you find that those tents by MSF, by Save the Children, by Oxfam, again, you are at their mercy to provide you with what? Accommodation. Which means, which means that you cannot criticize them, otherwise they will ah, evict you. No, 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 that is where you draw a line. Yes, you appreciate and you've got to be very transparent on there and say, we've arrived in this place courtesy of Save the Children. However, the story is this. Yeah. So you've got to demarcate that very clearly. But you, Thank you know they'll much. complain if they're not mentioned in the story. And they may not want to take you next time. Uh, no, you're very right. You're, no, that's a very a valid point, absolutely. Let's give a round of applause to him. That's a valid <laughs> point, honestly. Guys. That's what I'm proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> Omar, did you want to say something on um, Middle East? Uh, sorry, was that Sammy's question from Turkey? He's talking about the increased interest that Middle Eastern countries have in Africa. Well, I think there's a global interest in, uh, in the continent, which can only be a good thing. Mm -hmm. so, right. uh, so, yeah, I mean, the media space is getting more interesting and it's making it more viable for media organizations to operate. Um, mm -hmm. So going back to a previous question, but yeah. I do know that a, lot of, a, a number of TV channels and a number of media organizations are still funded by governments. For example, right. you mentioned Africa 24. Yes. That's f funded by the Cameroonian and Equatorial Guinean government right. to the tune of about 4 million euros a year. Do you know what the agenda is? And what do they want? Well, they're supposed to be a free channel, but uh, he, went, uh, he, he, needed, he required funding. No one was prepared to fund him. So, uh, so those two governments who wanted to contribute to the media landscape and possibly get uh, some, uh, 
some, um, yeah. some good cover or positive coverage or more coverage, actually. People aren't necessarily asking for positive coverage. They just want coverage. Yeah. Uh, so there might be other governments who are prepared to fund uh, people here, possibly. Well, say, I mean, well, you know what? Well, Euronews is, uh, is also starting an Africa, a Pan-African yeah. channel, oh, yeah. and that's being part-funded, so I, so I believe, by the Congolese government. Right. Brazil, Based in Brazil. Congo, Brazil. Brazil. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's very interesting stuff. Uh, uh, Henry, uh, <coughs> Bernab, you'll agree with me on this one, that, um, and as the lady there said, those aid agencies, we'll just go back to them. They've got a fully-fledged media outfit mm. oh, yeah. that has got, that's so well-resourced, and the people who had those media outfits, by the way, they're professional journalists, people yes. who've been working for no, BBC they, for They're all my colleagues. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. And who knows if after this you find me maybe in Action Aid and other places. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> if we do, we'll call you out. No, no, no. no. Uh, can, can, I just, um, can I just add one thing, actually? Go on. Because Le Monde, so uh, the most prestigious French language uh, publication, they've recently launched Le Monde Afrique, which is, uh, which is a website totally dedicated to, uh, to African coverage, and they're putting good journalists uh, to create great African coverage, but the, their finances is Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, wow. Rockefeller Foundation, yeah. so all these foundations have also obviously also got an agenda to push. Yeah. Whose money, whose story? Yep. Uh, online uh, bloggers, can they shift the agenda? That was Senna's question. What do you say, Savannah? I think that's very forward thinking of you. We've talked already on the panel today about how expensive television is becoming and how difficult it is to be able to get the news out when you want to get it out. I remember when, um, when, when, when the US SEALs went in to find bin Laden, the very first report was on Twitter within seconds after the, there was notice that there was something going on. And nowhere else can you deliver the news that quickly. And I think it's a tool that should be used, especially in Africa, where we're trying to tell the African story. Where better can we take that responsibility into our hands and start to put the news and the information out there? So I think it's, it's a very good point. It's definitely the direction in which things are going. But with one, one small corrective, I think, which, I think it was Lindiwe said earlier today, that let's remember it's, there's only 15% of Africa that is online this is a good point as yes well. we, you know That's i have fascinating conversations yeah. on twitter with with a with a nigerian community with a kenyan community but they are not the entire audience who watch al jazeera or bbc let alone the entire populations of kenya and nigeria it's very We've always got to bear in mind that yeah. you're speaking Thank to a small you, yeah. urban elite. That, that's uh, and, and that's absolutely true. So it fulfills its purpose within the arena that it can. It's not completely ruling out television and radio, and we've already heard the reach that radio has across the continent, but it certainly has a very, very important role to play. Thank you, Savannah. Well, it's, it's a democratisation of, uh, of media, so it can only be a good thing. And ultimately, what we're looking for, we're looking for good, uh, good journalists, good talent. It's a way of... Uh, getting talent. I mean, we, uh, we're continu continuously scouting for yeah. bloggers and uh, good... Uh... Well, you'll be bombarded after this session, don't <laughs> worry. And let's get to another round of questions. Yes, George. Do we have a microphone down here, please? Um, I've been thinking about the question I'm, I'm about to raise for a very long time. It's probably the only question that brought me to this conference. I think I'm in a very unique position in the sense that literally all the, all the institutions or from which the five people on the panel, their flagship panel, one way or the other, over the last 15 years, have interviewed me. Okay? And it's been the most horrible experience imaginable. <laughs> well, and you've been horrible. No, no, please. <laughs> Henry, Henry, this is serious. Okay. I am being serious, because yes, I've interviewed you, I remember. I remember. Just a Carry minute, on. just a minute, please. <laughs> Go on. This is not, a, this is not a, an antique roadshow, okay? Let me just be more serious than I mean. Okay. Okay, please. I have been interviewed by you, mm -hmm. okay? and this is not about you personally. I'm okay. talking systemically. Yeah. yeah. And it has to do with, the, does it make a difference that it's black African practitioners in the institutions that you work in, making a difference or not. And in reflecting over the last 15 years of my lived experience, it's been a nightmare. I mean it in that way. Mm -hmm. So the question I'm trying to ask is this. <coughs> What's, what, is it, what is it that makes you fail to realize that there is no story of African interest 
about the fact that Robert Mugabe is 91 tomorrow, which you continue to be preoccupied with, what is it that makes you fail to realize the difference between those two? Second, what is it that makes you fail to realize <clears throat> that African people are not stupid? Okay? That there are substantive intellectual, ideological, political position that result in the choices they make, which are very different from the preoccupations of your very programs, the very programs you produce about the African continent. Have Whether you finished, George? Yeah. Have you finished? No, I, I was going You've got another no, point three. Okay, go on. Point three. <laughs> what is it that is on your database, okay, that precedes the framing of the asked question when I come into your studio yeah. such that it ends up being such a horrible nightmare for me? For you. Well, Thank you, George. Like for me. you. <laughs> Thank you, George. Thank you. Thank you. I gave you your chance, and that's how you've used it. Thank you. Okay, next question. Yes, over there, yes. No, who, who, who was that? Yeah. No, not Akintayo, he's already spoken. <laughs> yes, okay. Me. Yes. Okay. Um, Vincent Gasana, just uh, media representation in Africa. This is an old chestnut. It comes up very, very often. Yes. And um, we did mention at the beginning of the discussion um, the new organizations that are coming out. But on the whole, are we not missing the um, obvious uh, problem in that uh, like most things in Africa, a lot of uh, foreign organizations go in to fill a vacuum. And in the media specifically, there is a vacuum of local media. It really doesn't exist in the sense that one would want it to um, think of, of, of journalism. And until that happens, we can keep going on about representations of Africa. Because if there were, for instance, I mean, um, Barnaby talked about um, what um, the, the material that his lady provides. If we had decent African media, they would be providing this material. Yeah. And then that would inform what, how Africa is represented. So the BBC, Al Jazeera, everybody, they're filling a vacuum. So who should be filling this vacuum in order that, that this representation Thank change? you very much, Vincent. And let's have one more question. Uh, lady behind the gentleman who's already spoken. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, my friend. You heard what I said. Okay, go on. Um, um, I, uh, and I want to ask a question drawing from what Solomon said. When Solomon was talking, he, he talked about respect, that programs that are done on African should be done with respect. You were emphasizing on respect. I just want to make reference. There was a program they did in BBC, that was in 2011, about the um, lower class people in Lagos Highland, in Lagos. I can't remember the program. I think it was a document. I can't remember the name, but welcome to yeah. Lagos. And oh yeah, welcome yeah, to okay. Lagos. Yes. We are talking about media representation. Yeah. I got to know that BBC didn't show the third episode because the staff from Nigerian High Commission went to tell the BBC to stop showing the program. That mm, it wasn't a good so. media. No, no, it showed all three. I they watched them all. all. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I also know that it wasn't a good representation of Nigeria because yeah. Nigerians, Nigerians that were born here, some of them didn't have a good representation about Nigeria. And probably people from other nationalities who are residing here, some of them didn't want to visit Nigeria because they felt oh, it's a poor country, see the way the place looks like, oh, it was like a slum area. So and some of us were saying it's that, why didn't the BBC show the slum areas and then show the posh areas in Lagos to balance? All right. you know? So, but people said, oh, if they show the posh area, they wouldn't get money. They wouldn't right. get money. So I want to ask, because you've been working in the African program since 2002, what, what did you do? Because I know there are more people who have made comments to you. I mean, Solomon and even and Philip as well. What did you people do? Because when talking about your African programs, I believe you've been bringing, you, there has been amendments, reforms. So, and you said that was a good rep We've got the point. media We're, representation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Just, um, just, okay. just to defend uh, Solomon, we all make mistakes. Maybe they made a mistake. So, uh, and they admitted it, I think. Okay, okay. Let, let someone, Solomon will speak for himself because, of course, you're, you're part something. of the BBC. Ah, yeah, yeah, somebody, somebody when I say we, something. I mean journalists in general. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I think you said that was in 2011, and I've been talking about uh, the kind of initiatives we've launched to try and tell the African story in a different way 
with the respect. Respect does not mean shying away from criticizing, and respect also does not mean, or if you are criticizing, it does not mean that you simply do it for the sake of doing it. And those initiatives we launched from 2012, in June when we launched Focus on Africa TV program, and we went on to launch um, BBC Swahili Service TV. Uh, last year we launched a BBC Hausa TV bulletin as well, together with the BBC French TV, and we're thinking about <coughs> BBC Somali TV sometime towards the end of this year or next year. Of course, subject to available of funds as they would normally say it. But it's important, I'm very glad you've touched on Nigeria. And this is why I'm saying, and we've been telling colleagues as well within the BBC and anybody who cares to listen, there's a bigger story to Nigeria than Boko Haram. There's a bigger story to Nigeria than what you saw in 2011. There's a bigger story to Nigeria. Uh, away from the, uh, th those ethnic conflicts we hear because others have gone from one village to another and people attacked each other, there are bigger stories to Nigeria than meets the eye or your ear. And those are the stories we want our team in Nigeria to reflect on, to cover, to report. We have a team of African reporters together with, of course, our colleagues from what we call News Gathering, people like Will Ross, but we've got BBC House of Service and other African reporters in Nigeria to tell the Nigerian story. But, 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 but what this lady remembers yeah. is in 2011, that had prime time, three hours on, was it BBC Two or BBC One? Two. B B BBC Two. So even if that had nothing to do with your team, still, that was a mass audience and she feels... Absolutely. The thing is, w w once these things happen, we are all one BBC. When it, it was shown on the BBC, there's no distinction amongst the audience whether it came from BBC Africa mm -hmm. or BBC this, this and that. And a very good example is what happened last year in October when BBC Two showed a documentary called Rwanda's Untold Stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was shown here only by the BBC too. Yeah. But who is paying the price for it? It's BBC Great Lakes Service, which has been suspended from broadcasting into Rwanda because they're a part of the BBC. So we carry that blame collectively. Mm -hmm. And where a mistake was said, as Omar said, yes, mistakes do happen. Let's face it, mistakes do happen. George, mistakes happen. Mistakes happen. And what makes a difference, what makes a difference is when we own up and say a mistake has, been, has happened here, we need to correct it. And also for every story we cover, for every event, for every personality, there are two different sides yeah. of the coin, isn't it? Yeah. There are two, two different sides to Henry, to Solomon, to Savannah, to Barnaby, to Omar. Yeah. And you must reflect those sides of the story. So say, we, when we get yeah, fixated yeah. on, say, Robert Mugabe, and I actually do sometimes question this fixation about Uncle Bob. Even when Uncle Bob is dancing, they say he's falling. <laughs> there are things we need to take seriously, report both sides of the story, and then leave it to the audience to pass their own judgment. And nowadays with social media, Henry, we no longer have the monopoly we used to have as, as media organizations over coverage of stories. Yes. Tremendous. Thank you very much. Um, Vincent raised a point about the vacuum of local media presence in many African countries, and that's the reason why the global channels uh, have, continue to have so much sway. That's essentially the point you were making, so it's no point complaining if the local media infrastructure hasn't been built up and isn't telling the story from the ground up. Any thoughts on that, Savannah? Uh, I, I mean, I would say uh, you're right, but I would say things are changing and changing in, in the right direction. If, if people are old enough uh, to remember, you know, the dead hand of monopolized dead hand of state African media in the 70s or 80s, we've come a long way from there. Uh, we, you know, we, we, yes, we must question the Africa rising uh, dictum, but th 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 there's truth in there that economies and middle classes are growing across Africa. And organizations like the BBC or like Al Jazeera have had to respond to that and improve that and deepen their African coverage as a result. The, the pressure's on. And ultimately, the good quality domestic output from within Africa will, will rise. And I've no doubt will take its place. I mean, the organizations like the BBC have changed beyond all, all imagination, Solomon. I, I can remember, you know, when I joined uh, the BBC in, in 1991, the, the foreign language services in Bush House, it, there would be uh, essentially, you know, 
let's not mince it, you know, a white British person in charge of yeah. each foreign language service who didn't even speak that language. I mean, it was that absurd. Yeah. The Somali, the head of the Somali service could not speak Swahili. The, uh, um, Somali. Somali, the head of the Swahili service could, uh, could not speak um, Swahili, and, and the same with Hausa. And they were almost like sort of district officers who were kind of, oh, you know, who were there to make sure that, you know, <laughs> things didn't get out of hand insofar as they could not even understand the content of what, uh, you know, th those, those, those times have, have changed a lot. Um, mm -hmm. But I suppose I also have to stand up for journalism and, and what we do. You, you, you spoke about the, the Welcome to Lagos series. I, I never saw it, but I do, I do remember once having a, a conversation with a woman in, in Abuja, and it was when Bill Clinton visited in, in 2000. And he was staying at the Hilton Hotel in Abuja, which costs you know, hundreds of dollars. And 200 yards away, there were huge queues of Nigerians waiting for petrol for hours, and it was much worse then. And we filmed that, and I took the decision that in our one minute 40, which is all we're given on the evening news of Bill Clinton's visit, we would show the irony that you know, while he's there because of oil interests, Nigerians cannot get petrol at yeah. their own pumps. She was furious at me. Yeah. She kept, this woman cut, cut out of her car and said it was a disgrace. Why was I showing this on such an important day for Nigeria? I should be showing rich Nigerians in the Hilton Hotel, she said, to show the complexity of the country. I disagree with her. I made an editorial call, and I disagree with her. Malabi, thank you very much for that. I'm sorry. That, and, and know, we, can, we can discuss this at yeah. much greater length later. But, yeah, uh, we, we, we're, kind of, we're over. But just, Savannah, sorry, I just want to ask you, how confident are you, um, as, well, are you, are you as confident as Barnaby is that that local African media presence, the infrastructure, is growing, is developing? You've watched it, you've tracked it over a period of years. What do you think now? It's, it's definitely changed face over the last 10, 15 years, and it has improved, and there is massive scope to continue to improve it, especially with individuals like yourselves in the room that are talented, that are passionate about making a difference, even though you don't like hearing that word, Omar, but passionate about having an impact and really delivering balanced information. There's massive scope. It, a, a large part, portion of it always will come down to funding and it's access to funding and then offsetting that against the competition and the increased competition that is there and that's not going to go away um, and also you know it's a bit like the lady said at the front before you know you, where is the funding coming from and it's almost a case of who pays the piper so you're also looking at a case of you may want to report this but what can be reported what are we able to do with the funding that we have available? So there's a lot of different challenges that are there that are not going to go away. Um, but there's definitely the scope for all of us as individuals to do the very best we can to put out the very best quality of content. Tremendous. Closing the mic, Sajida. You've got 10 seconds. Um, <laughs> okay, 25. I, I, yeah, I just wanted to say one thing which is really, really uh, challenging my mind, being in this country as an African journalist. When... And if you've read newspapers in this country and even listen to radio and watch television, if a child goes missing, mm. if a child is murdered, or anybody, it becomes a headline story, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's not about David Cameron. It's not about the coalition government. It is about that human life. And that is something I admire about the media sometimes in this country. Let's flip the coin and look at how we cover our local media in Africa do things. More than 200 girls are taken by a militant group into the forest. These are people's daughters. And we can't make it a headline story. When we have got things happening miles away, we've got our African presidents sending condolences yeah, exactly. and demonstrating their solidarity, yet in their own backyard, 2,000 people are being massacred. Yeah. Yeah. You know? That I've got, to, I've got to have a president's story congratulating another leader, but I cannot talk about a one-year-old being mutilated in Tanzania because that girl or that boy is an albino. And then I'm told that you're not covering Africa very well because my African leader was not story number one, or when they were story number one, you criticize them. I refuse. I say journalism is about humanity. Solomon Mugera, Savannah Nightingale, Omar Banyeda, Barnaby Phillips, thank you very much indeed for discussing. If it bleeds, it leads. New money, same old story. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, guys.